Sandra Campbell used to teach <laughs> at the Pauline Jewett Institute of Women's and Gender Study at Carleton University. That's right, yes. Now that's all we've got on uh, the dust jacket of Both Hands, A Life of Lorne Pierce of Ryerson Press, which we're here to talk about today. So perhaps, unless there's something inside here. No, no, I was very self-effacing on the dust jacket. (laughs) Um, I'm recently retired from Carleton, from the Pauline Jewett Institute. Okay. Um, I'm still the general editor of a critical series for Tecumseh Press on early Canadian women writers. I've taught not only at Carleton, but also at the University of Ottawa, where I got my PhD, and at McGill University, and at Bermuda College, because both my husband and I spend a lot of time in Bermuda and do a lot of writing on Bermuda history and literature and culture generally. I've also published um, three anthologies as co-editor, three anthologies of short stories by Canadian women during the period 1880 to 1920. It's that late 19th, early 20th century period that interests me very much. So, and I've published quite a bit on Canadian criticism and Canadian publishing generally, but arising out of my work on Lauren Pierce. So I would say that it's the life of people behind the scenes, the life and influence of people behind the scenes that's really driven my career. And that's what's led, that's what led me to an interest in Lauren Pierce and to applying for a shirt grant to work on his life. And the, and the book, Both Hands, was the result of that. Okay. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Oh, thank you. Well, Lauren Pierce wasn't behind the scenes. Oh, I think that he was in many ways, because I think that what was a surprise to people when the book came out was, for instance, that he personally conceptualized and edited many of the his successful pioneer textbook series. I think people didn't realize how much of his influence and interest lay behind the kind of authors he selected and promoted. He really had carte blanche. And you know, he's largely unknown today. Unless you're talking to people like you and me, literateurs, and especially people like me of a certain age, I'm 68 now, um, they don't even know who Lauren Pierce is and they're only dimly aware of Ryerson Press. You know, a few people might say, musing, oh yes, McGraw-Hill Ryerson, but He's certainly behind the scenes now. And then one of the reasons I wrote the book was I wanted to recover him. I was so tired of people assuming, often scholars, that Canadian literature really started in 1960. That's mm-hmm. always driven me crazy. Even though I know it's a tendency in Canadian literature, when you look at the writers of the 1920s, for instance, the poets of the McGill movement, F.R. Scott, Leo Kennedy, A.G.M. Smith, A.M. Klein, Mm. they rejected the poets of the late Confederation period, Robert Scott, Carmen, and the like. Without even reading them, they assumed they were inferior and started. And it's been a little ways, it's been a little bit like that with the 60s as well. In that sense, he was behind the scenes. And of course, when, when you think about his writers, many of them became well-known or controversial. But well, he was also, and you make the point, that, that he was quite influential bringing some of the modernists to the fore. That's right. And that's where he... Which is very surprising. Yes. Well, see, that's where he's been occluded, as we like to say, in critical theory. And you see, people weren't anxious, people like... You know, as I make the point, people weren't anxious, people like Louis Dudek, even Smith, to admit how much they owed to what went before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you think of A.J.M. Smith and his influential book of Canadian poetry. When Mm -hmm. he got a Guggenheim to work on that, he knew very little about Canadian poetry outside of his Senat. So he really basically learned about the whole of Canadian poetry through researching that book and coming in contact with people like Pelham Edgar and Lauren Pierce and E.K. Brown, the critic. Uh, You're talking about uh, his anthology, 1943, that one? Yes, the book yeah. of Canadian Poetry, which yeah. was enormously influential, but it was also a, lear- a big learning experience for A.G.M. Smith. It's kind of ironic it was published in, out of Chicago, right? Yes, it is kind of ironic. Or typical. Uh, he, he, Arthur Smith, was based in the United States, as you know, at the University of Michigan. So mm-hmm. there were a number of forces operating there. And, of course, 
it was published in wartime. Mm. And there was paper shortages and all kinds of uh, factors influencing the publication of that book. So Lauren Pierce... Lauren Pierce is, was certainly well known in publishing circles. Yeah. But he was never a household name. Okay. So I'm going to paint a bit of a picture of him. Okay. Based on what I've uh, gleaned from your book. Right. When was he born? He was born in 1890 in eastern Ontario, in a small town in eastern Ontario. He was Delta. Delta. Yeah. His father owned a hardware store. And put him through five university degrees. Yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, Lauren and he, Lauren's parents, Hattie yeah. and, and Ed Pierce, believed in education, particularly his mother. He was an impassioned cultural nat nationalist. He suffered from lupus and had a serious uh, hearing problem. Yep. Uh, he was a prolific author. He was a rabid book collector. Yes, rabid and avid, both. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he was a Freemason. Yes. The tenets of which include moral idealism and community involvement. Yeah. And he was, I think to use your words here, a seminal figure over 40 years. That's right. In Canadian cultural publishing, both art and literature and, and criticism. He was a maker of Canada. That's right. Okay. Anything else? Um, I think, well, to add to what you were saying about um, his recognition, I don't think many people realize the role he played in Canadian art and Canadian art criticism. Mm -hmm. I think that that's something that, I think my biography kind of coalesced that role, which I don't think was well understood earlier than that. It was known within his family and say, at the Art Gallery of Ontario, but... Well, he collected art, too, yes. right? Yeah. He was a total workaholic. Yeah. You know, and he was an idealist. He was... He was a man of incredible, prodigious energy. You know, he was exhausting to work on because... But he, he, he never burned stopped. out a number of times, too, yes, though, he didn't did. he? Yes, yeah. he did. Yeah. And, you know, when you talk to people who have lupus, they're the more amazed at his accomplishments mm -hmm. because, you know, lupus is... is uh, Part of the symptoms are the periodic diminution of energy. Mm. And when you talk to anybody who has a hearing uh, handicapped as, a, as acute as his, because he was what we call technically profoundly deafened, they're also amazed because when you think about publishing, it's about schmoozing, isn't it? That's right. This is a guy who was never able to talk on the telephone effectively. So he communicated mostly uh, by the written word. Yes, and in the last 20 years of his career, Basically, Frank Flemington, his uh, assistant, would make phone calls for him, would take notes for him. And in fact, in the book of letters between Duncan Campbell Scott and E.K. Brown, the poet and the critic, um, Scott and Brown talk about Pierce's handicap and say often mix-ups or misunderstandings that seem the result of something else were actually the result of his defective hearing. So no wonder he became a founder of what's now the Canadian Hearing Society. Yeah. Pierce did, I mean. He had a sense of community and nation. He had strong spiritual faith. He was a Methodist. Do you call them Methodist preachers or not? He was a Methodist preacher, yes, yeah. a Methodist minister. Mm -hmm. Although I think that by the time, by the time 1930 came, I think he was a spiritual person, but I don't think... He was any longer a conventional Christian believer, although he re remained a minister. He certainly uh, always was a strongly spiritual man throughout his life. He uh, impressed older people. Yes, uh, he liked mentors, he liked older people. I think part of that was that he really, he was always, you know, the egghead, the smart kid. And his father was a wonderful man, but he was not an intellectual, Ed Pierce. And so there was a pattern in Lauren Pierce right from the time he went to university mm. of locating older intellectual men and they becoming his mentors. Sometimes with troubled results, you know, um, uh, A.D. Watson led him into spiritualism, which mm. was controversial in the 20s, but there was always this pattern. And I think that's quite common with successful men. Mm. I mean, when we look at the role of what defines or the template of what defines, define success often in organizations it's this 
idea of mentorship. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly something to which he really responded and sought out. He loved Queen's University. Yes, he described it as his big debauch. And he was linked to Queen's in many ways throughout his life. He was very generous to Queen's. He left his papers to Queen's. And, of course, his wonderful collection of Canadiana, <laughs> starting in the 20s. Plus, uh, he adopted their worldview of the importance of contributing intellectually and spiritually to a nation's life. Yes. The spirit uh, of service. Yes, he went to, the, to Queen's in the aftermath of the principalship of Principal Grant. Uh, Grant was dead by the time he got there, but the university was very infused with that. And, you know, I discovered something only after I published the book that I wish I'd discovered earlier, and that is there's a photograph of all the young men and women from uh, Leeds County who are at Queen's, taken in first year when they're freshmen. And you look at Lauren Pierce, and he's wearing a badly made, ill-fitting suit, and he's looking extremely anxious. And then you realize that when you're writing biography, you tend to look back from the successful, confident man mm. and not see the scared, out of his depth kid. And so when he came to Queens, he was very much in search. And Queens gave him those things that he wanted. And I think we, we can't afford to forget that. Yeah. He threw himself into... Uh university life to the point where some of his marks suffered. Exactly. He flunked English. He flunked James Kaplan's English exam, final English exam. And mm -hmm. I think there wasn't probably an element of vindictiveness in that. I mean, he had challenged Kaplan. So he really had to spend part of his time making up that course. No, and that was one of the first great shocks to him in his yeah. life. When it's setbacks. Yes, yeah. exactly. But mm -hmm. a shock because yeah. he did have that expectation bigger and better every day in every way. And, you know, diaries are so interesting. Working on his diaries, I began to realize what complex documents diaries really are because the things that were negative and that mattered most to him are often not in the diary or are kind of buried in little phrases and... Yeah, it's very much an edited version of your life, right? Exactly, yeah. yes. This uh, a quote, I'm quoting you here. Yes. On page 85, where, uh, I'm uh, paraphrasing you, he chose a worldview that celebrated the significance of life versus life being meaningless. Yes, oh yes, he did. And that came out of his Methodist heritage, and that came from his mother. Mm -hmm. You can't overestimate the influence of his mother. She you was. Know. Would you say she was domineering, or close to it? Uh, I, th I think she was. I think domineering is the wrong word. Okay. I think she was inspirational and she was driven, and she grew up in an era where, for women to believe that they were successful, they had to be the hand that rocks the cradle that rules the world. Mm. And she fully subscribed to that. She was definitely somebody whom Lauren had to come to terms with as an influence to develop as a person. Mm. I mean, one of his struggles is to differentiate between what his mother wanted for him and what he wanted for himself. And he learned to maneuver that quite adroitly mm. uh, without open rebellion. You know, she... <laughs> Hattie Pierce always talked about the importance of what she called the mighty monosyllable, that is no. And he learned how to say no to his mother, but always in a kind of elliptical way. Because mm, yeah. they, they had a good relationship. They had a very, yes, they did have a good mm. relationship, mm. but it was a complex relationship. Okay. You know, she she's a woman who would have been, a, I would think, an important Methodist minister in her time if she had been born male. Would you say that his obsessive work habits came out of Methodism or not? Oh, I think they came out of a number of things. I think they came out of, yes, he had that zeal and drive of his Methodism. They also came from his mother, mm -hmm. who never cut him any slack no matter what. You know, the doctor, when he's a young boy, is saying, oh, you've got to keep an eye on Lauren. Because he was, he was sickly, wasn't he, as a kid? Yes. Uh, no, you're getting on the train. You're going to high school in Athens. And also, I think that he had a sense, his lupus wasn't diagnosed as such till the end of the 1920s, 
but he always knew that he wasn't strong. Mm. So then he had this feeling that, well, if I'm going to do anything, it has to be now. It has to be soon. What, because he figured he was going to get really sick or well, die? Yes, or yes, what? yes. I think he yeah. knew he wouldn't live that long. Mm. It's amazing that he lived to be as old as he did. He lived to be 72. Um, and when you consider how serious some of the lupus flare-ups were, and of course he was diagnosed with tuberculosis when he was invalided out of the army. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, he didn't have much of a convalescence as far as rest was concerned. Just driven. He was driven. Okay, so let's uh, look at the fact that his obsessive work habits created marital strife. He got married, what, early... In 1916. 16. Yes. After a long and arduous courtship, yes. That's right. She kept sort of uh, putting him off, right? Yes, indeed. Yeah. But, as I say, this obsessive work habit caused a fair amount of grief for his wife. Yes, because she was a woman trying to raise two children. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, of course, when he became a publisher, it was a big change of lifestyle for them both. They went from rural or small village to urban. Uh, She didn't have the kind of prescribed role as minister's wife anymore. Uh, Money problems. And, of course, he devoted a lot of money to collecting books. Yes, which is a topic we're going to focus on. Yes. So, yes, it caused marital tension. And also he betrayed his principles. He lied to her over making a donation to... Uh, fund the Lauren Pierce Medal of the Royal Society of Canada. Oh, yeah, he did that just... behind her back, right? Exactly. Yeah, that was 500 bucks, I think, or something yes, like that. Yes, but that's that. an enormous oh, yes, sum. Yes, yes. Uh, and it caused problems. It would cause problems in any marriage. Mm-hmm. But you see, overweening ambition. He saw the literature at this point, I guess, very early on, because he became, and it wasn't publisher, it was an advisor, literary Editor and literary advisor yes, to the... It was it, a new it, position it that was. the Ryerson Press set up for him. Yes, and the Ryerson Press was the the Canadian publishing division of the Methodist Book and Publishing House. Mm-hmm. Because don't forget, the book steward of the time, Fallis, was, um, was not himself experienced in publishing. So mm-hmm. he thought, oh, well, we'll get somebody in here. He can write my, col- my book review columns for the Christian Guardian. He can do this and do that. So, but he didn't, you know, I make the point, and I think it's very true, that he really didn't know what a dynamo he tired. Yeah, and there was some tension in that relationship for sure. Yes, there was. Yeah. And if one of Lauren Pierce's flaws was he couldn't always see that other people resented his, his, his dynamism. Exactly. Yeah. And his love for the spotlight. He wasn't always conscious that you had to kind of coddle the boss early on. Later mm. on, he, he became more sophisticated. But at that early date, he saw literature as an evolving national entity, a force for national cohesion and moral idealism. Yeah. He did. And that part became out of the experience of the First World War. Mm -hmm. Not only his own experience on the home front, uh, being involved with the care of wounded soldiers here in Kingston and Onwadada, but also he had a cousin who died at Vimy. So he did have that kind of developing national consciousness. But how does literature tie in with that? Uh, Because literature, he saw literature's role as kind of the cement and the celebration of the country as a whole. Okay. So one of the reasons that Pierce was hired was to give original book publication a new status within the house, and that by that, Canadian books. Yes, but I think there was something a little bit retrospective in that. Mm. I think that was more his own private crusade than it was a huge item in the mind of the book steward, Samuel Fallis. That's my hypothesis at any rate. Okay. This is just as an aside, copyright uh, based on first publication in Canada was much less advantageous than first publication in the U.S. and That's Great right. Britain. That's right. So and, uh, it, was, it must have been difficult to get Canadian authors to publish their uh, first in Canada. Especially successful Canadian authors, mm-hmm. you're quite right. 
And, you know, when you look at the travails he had with publication rights for Carmen and Roberts, for instance, who were enthralled to Page in Boston, the same publisher that yeah. tried to hold Ellen Montgomery captive, you can see what the difficulties were. Yeah. You know, copyright has always been a vexatious issue in Canadian publishing and for Canadian writers. Look at uh, William Kirby and Susanna Moody both had travails with copyright, yeah, in the 19th century. Pierce was dedicated to presenting the ideal in words and art, believing it could inspire the individual and exalt society. And he denounced materialism and the sensationalism of the 1920s. Yes, yes, he did. And that, that sort of strong idealism came partly out of his Masonic ideals, partly out of what he imbibed at Queen's. And if you look at the sort of prominent literary figures of the 1920s, the establishment figures, older men like Pelham Edgar, for instance, and Duncan Campbell Scott, there was always a fear of things like jazz and um, avant-garde writing and women telling all. Margot Asquith's memoir was yeah. something they were universally scandalized by. Um, this kind of establishment elite. So you see these tensions operating. Right, and I guess he was a big supporter of prohibition. Yes, he was. And in fact, at one point, he makes sure that he's not on business trip, not away, so he can vote for temperance in Ontario in mm -hmm. the 1920s. One thing that is surprising and current, I guess, is his desire for a French-English entente throughout his career. He, he reached out to, the, to, to French writers in Canada. Yes, he did. And, and I think that, well, of course, if you're a Canadian nationalist, one of the things you come up against or have to think about is the French fact. Mm. And, and once again, you know, uh, this, this is something that we see operating in Canadian history and among certain intellectuals right from the beginning. And you think of uh, Cartier and MacDonald, for instance. Yeah. Yeah, he responded to that. And I think he picked some of that up at Queen's. And plus he had, a, I guess because he, he, he went out early in his career as a, a preacher, he went out to Western Canada and, and got a taste of, uh, of sort of the diverse ethnic That's uh, right. population and that really, there. That was really, uh, I think, a life-changing experience for him that mm. time on the prairies. First of all, it was personal freedom in the sense that he was away from his families and mm. the constraints of Ontario. And his mother, and his particularly. Mother, and his yeah. mother particularly. And But he was also experiencing this the so-called men and women in sheepskin coats, this incredible ethnic diversity that mm. came from immigration. And he was organizing. And of course, here's where the Masons were important to him. You know, in an age before credit cards and before easy communication, that was his bona fides. That's why he was able to get bank loans. You know, the fellow Mason and the handshake. That's become mm -hmm. a cliche, but mm -hmm. that kind of brotherhood was very important. Yeah, it was a real... Kind of a positive network for him. Exactly. His goal when he came to Ryerson, a stated goal early on, was to make Ryerson a cultural mecca of Canada. That's right. That's a pretty, pretty uh, lofty goal. Yes, but all his, all the prerequisites of his life, all the prior events had encouraged him to be lofty. Mm -hmm. Methodism is lofty, Queens is lofty, Freemasonry is lofty, mm -hmm. and then he gets involved in theosophy, that's lofty too. <laughs> what, one thing I really like about him is his, uh, his interest in the book as object. Yeah. He said at one point, this again was sort of within the first couple of years of him starting to work at Ryerson, what is useful and readable ought to be beautiful. And that was the influence of his mother, because his mother was very interested in Ruskin, and she was quite artistic her, herself, so that's mm. where that all started. Yeah. And he hired one of the group of seven, Fred Varley. That's right. And he designed a number of books, and particularly as a couple of them, E.J. Pratt's first yes, Newfoundland verse book yes. of poetry yep. and uh, the and also Marjorie critic. Pickthall, a book of remembrance. Okay, yeah. and also a, a a book by the critic uh, Deacon. 
Yes, William Arthur Deacon's Pens and Pirates. Pens yeah. and Pirates. I've had a look at those books. They're, they're, they are. Uh, and he was very proud of those books. I think yes. he thought those were the first really... Well, he saw them as kind of pioneering in in sort of in the typography in the kind of post World War typography. Mm. Deacon's a very interesting character, a very quite a complex and difficult one. Mm. You know, his grandson is the director of the National Arts Center, Christopher Deacon. Didn't know that. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Now here we get into a series that he again very ambitious. This was called the Makers of Canada series. Makers of Canadian Literature. Okay. He was inspired by the earlier Makers of Canada series, the historical series that was edited uh, early in the century by for George Morang, the publisher. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so this one is the Makers of Canadian Literature. Yes, and the sort of similar idea that literature is going to be inspirational and unifying. And so this was sort of a short biography. First of all, he, he selected different writers. That's right. And then assigned people to editors. Yes, they yeah. were basically critical anthologies. Yeah, because they including their works. Yes, yeah. exactly. They yeah. they incorporated criticism, biography, and key portions of the literature of the writer in question. And that kicked off in 1923. Yes, and he was very generous in the the amount of money that he paid to these editors. Well, he was green. He was green and he lost money big yes, time. Yes, he did. And the series got cancelled. And in fact, one of the poignant things, if you look in the some of the uh, Lauren Pierce papers and also in other collections, there exists the manuscripts of volumes that were never published. For instance, mm -hmm. one on Duncan Campbell Scott, one on Archibald Lampman. But this, you know, this became a big tussle between Pierce and his book steward. But it was... It was laudably ambitious, mm -hmm, if, mm -hmm. if impractical in some respects, yeah. What about the physical books themselves? Are they, are they handsome or not? They are, they are handsome, and they came out in two series. One is leather-bound, like mm. in Morocco, leather with gilt lettering, and then also a cloth-bound series with gold lettering. Yes, they are quite handsome, and they have... Th I th uh, if I remember correctly, and I could stand to be corrected... Mm. I think Thoreau MacDonald was involved in designing them as well. Thoreau or his father? No, Thoreau. This is another example of uh, Pierce's view that art was for art for nation's sake. That's right. Nationhood over empire. That's right. Well, of course, here's where his Irish heritage is very important mm -hmm. because he didn't have that kind of love for Britain. Uh, an empire, that automatic knee-jerk love. You know, Pelham Edgar, for instance, when he went to London for the first time oh, around 1904 and 1906, he said, once I had arrived, I knew I was home. Right. <laughs> that was not the feeling that Pierce had. Pelham Edgar, was a, was he a professor at uh, he was Victoria a, Vic College? And he was, he's best remembered today as Northrop Fry's teacher and mentor. Okay. Yeah. Pierce, at this point, saw himself as a chronicler, an interpreter, and a champion of, of Canadian literature. Yes. Or, as he put it somewhat more colloquially in his diaries, I've helped a lot of lame dogs over the style, meaning literary dogs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Canadians must preserve, there's a quote from him, a Canadians must preserve a national literature as the first step toward national self-preservation. I want to get to this currently as well yeah but this is how he felt back then and this was this really spurred him on right exactly yes so the the makers of canadian literature was a flop a failure how many of those did they put out do you remember oh uh, it's in the book i think about 13 actually appeared okay it was a financial flop but it yeah. certainly made his reputation within the literary community and of mm -hmm. course the shrewd thing about commissioning a series like that both the people you whose titles you include and the people you commission, mm. you have you suddenly have a constituency. When well, giving them money for one thing. Exactly. Yeah. But of course, it also soured his relations with certain writers. For instance, Duncan Campbell Scott, I think, never forgave Pierce yeah. for the fact that both his volume never appeared, nor did the one that Scott had edited on Lampman. That so kind of speaks to his ego as much as anything. 
Oh, sure. But, you know, as you well know, having a publishing podcast series, <laughs> ego plays an extremely large role in literary publishing. Uh, no, no. It's all about the guest on the podcast. <laughs> okay. It's not about the host. <laughs> Canadians must preserve. Yeah, we were there. Okay, so he sort of then takes a step down. He doesn't let go of this idea. He launches a series of chat books. That's be right. Because they're cheaper, cheap, and the authors subsidize their own work. Yes, yes, because publishing poetry has always been a financial struggle for Canadian publishers. So mm. this was his compromise. Mm -hmm. And it was a shrewd and successful one. And well, it, sorry, it's the longest running series in, ever in Canada. Yes, and uh, you know, uh, I think that right now, based on some manuscripts I've been asked to read and things, there's quite a, quite a debate and quite an interest now in the literary significance of these chapbooks, for mm -hmm. better and for worse. The Ryerson chapbooks. And of course, McClellan and Stewart in initiating a bit later the Indian file series mm -hmm. that yeah. was that was influenced very heavily by the Ryerson chapbook model well yes and no i mean there there's only nine of them and they're books they're they're handsome yes, books yes but they're, they're not... little books they're not big that's books true. that's yeah. true <laughs> okay so anything else happening in the 20s well of course there's his interest in fiction which you know soon comes a cropper because he chooses to publish uh, Frederick Philip Grove's uh, novel Settlers of the Marsh. And you know, in a sense, it was a tribute or it, it arose out of Pierce's own experience in the West because the world of, of difficulty and degradation that, that Grove painted in Settlers of the Marsh was something that Pierce knew was true and knew had to be recorded. But I think that because he saw that as so true to what had gone on in the prairies, it kind of blinded him to what the controversy would be mm -hmm. when it was mm -hmm. published. And I think he came so near to being let go in that controversy, being fired from Ryerson Press, that it made him, you know, he had come, his Methodist origins were always suspicious of fiction anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, the novels are seen as kind of dubious morally that it kind of he was wary forever afterwards so but so he kind of got burned because there was, burned. there was exactly. sex there was sex in that novel there was sex and he, uh, he allowed it to, to get through the yes and the, because he knew how authentic a picture mm -hmm. Grove had painted in many ways yeah it's interesting that's probably the only the only novel that was uh, that he thought was any good of Grove's because Grove wrote a ton of yeah but that. he published Grove on other occasions they were like and you know Grove was a difficult author and I think one of the things that we have that I would like to point out right now is how it's a natural often a natural tension between publishers and authors mm. and there's often no love lost and if there's one thing I realized in working in a publisher's paper is being a publisher is a thankless task and being an author is a thankless task. And there's to many, in many ways, a built-in tension there. There's not a lot of money in it, that's for sure. Yes, and but don't forget Pierce by, by the 1930s was living in a large opulent house in Hogs Hollow in Toronto. But that was yes. because of the commissions he was making off the textbooks, right? It was from both things. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't have been living in Hogs Hollow if he just had his reader's royalties, and he wouldn't have been living in Hogs Hollow if he'd, he'd just been a publisher. It was the combination of the two. Yeah. But he was still a lot better off, even if he'd only had his editor's salary, than, most, than the vast majority of his writers. Especially during the 30s. Yeah. But you know... The truth about the 30s is that if you had a job, you could actually live quite well mm. because prices fell. My, yeah. his, my business historian husband pointed that out to me, and it's certainly true. Any job, yeah. So when did, the, when did he start sort of getting busy on the school textbooks? The late 1920s. Right. The late 1920s. The idea, he, 
you know, he realized that he needed something to carry the financial freight at Ryerson Press mm -hmm. to make money so that he could do more fine art, belle publishing. Yeah. And he also wanted to get some royalty income for himself. And he also wanted to leave a mark on the minds of school children. And in all three, he was remarkably successful. Mm. Yeah. He wanted to turn them into good citizens. Exactly. Exactly. And when you think about it, you know, I, you couldn't do the sort of thing he does now because textbooks don't enjoy the same hegemony. But, you know, I've noticed the difference in my students since Canadian history is no longer compulsory after grade 10 and starting with grade 10 in Ontario. You really realize that kids don't come in with the same kind of body of knowledge. Hmm. So... You know, he recognized that they were tools. He saw them very much in that way, tools mm -hmm. on a variety of levels, financial, mm -hmm. cultural. Tools financial for for the Ryerson Press. And for himself. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. The cream. The family used to call it the cream. Because he got these commission checks on top of his regular so salary. So he could collect art, he could collect books, yeah. collect early Canadian glass. That's what his wife, his wife did. Yeah. yeah, but he was very interested in that as well and kept it up after her death. Well, I thought she could, uh, could, uh, donated that collection to the AGO. Uh, well, they made, some, uh, they made some donations before her death in 1954, but the bulk of stuff went after she died okay. in her name. Yeah. Okay. He was involved with Gerald Stevens, who was an early pioneer of Canadian glass. Man, he's a renaissance man. Yeah, you see? Yeah. We're exhausted just talking about it. <laughs> okay, so what about the 30s then? Anything else important in the 30s? Well, in the 1930s, ironically enough, the readers start to become very successful. Mm -hmm. um, the textbooks. Yes, yeah. the textbooks. Um, and in the 1930s, it's in some ways a holding operation because, you know, the publishing lists have to be cut back so much because book book sales fall through the floor yeah yeah but um, it's also it's also an interesting decade for him because for instance he gets his first chance to go to europe and you know all his life he's that was that was on holidays though well it was holiday but it was a huge learning experience don't yeah. forget it was guided tours everywhere it was a guided tour and for just a for instance he was in austria when the austrian chancellor was assassinated <laughs> And his guide in Vienna, he ended up helping come to Canada as a refugee yeah. Um, yeah. from the Nazis. So, And, you know, one of the most fascinating things to look at in the Lauren Pierce papers at Queen's, at the Queen's archives, is the little notebook that he kept when they were visiting all these things, you know, the Vatican, Buckingham Palace, copious notes. He was hungry, hungry, hungry to see all this. <laughs> And of course... That was his only trip to Europe, wasn't it? It was his only trip. Yeah. And he also went to visit his cousin's grave, his cousin who died at Vinny. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was a very, I think, important moment in his life. <laughs> because he had had a chance to live an adult life and his cousin never had. That was another thing that drove him. Well, he wanted to live as big a life as he could yeah, for he his cousin. As well as because he knew his cousin had not had that chance, exactly. and the two had gone yeah. through Queens together. Yeah, speaking of trips, at this point he went across Canada selling. Yes, he was sent across Canada starting in the mid 1920s to promote the Ryerson Press list and increasingly to promote the textbooks. Mm -hmm. So those were very important trips because he really saw the country, and he did that annually, uh, pretty well annually. Yes. Yeah. And it was pretty grueling. It was by train. Yeah. And then yeah. he would make separate trips through the Maritimes as well. So he basically s embraced the entire country. So when does this this art series start? He did a he did a series of again. It wasn't that many books. But... Uh, it starts in the nineteen thirties, and it really comes out of a number of things. He'd always loved art. Mm. One of his mentors at Queens had been a great art collector. The religion professor but he also because he's involved in the arts and letters club right from the time he moves to toronto mm. he meets people like j.e.h mcdonald mm -hmm. and he meets many of the gallery owners and museum directors and he loves canadian art 
and he loves the group of seven and that whole genre. And he realizes that even less is known about Canadian art that was known in, than was known about Canadian literature yeah. in a systematic fashion. So he gets involved in the Canadian art series. And if you talk to art historians, they'll tell you how pioneering that series was. And again, these were kind of mono. These were monographs on Canadian artists with some illustrations, not many in color, because of course that was very expensive. Wasn't and, there some kind of deal with Grip, the or the the design firm? Uh, well, he we asked. He was involved with the design firm, not with Grip. Grip was earlier. Many of these artists had come out of Grip, like right. C. W. Jeffries. And of course, if we're talking about the 1930s, you also have to consider how important the picture gallery of Canadian history is, which are C. W. Jeffries illustrated volumes about Canadian history or illustrations of Canadian history. So that's when they started as well, is that I right? I believe they started in the late 1920s. There were three volumes published and that embraced the late 20s, 30s and 40s. And again, that's an illustrated his history of Canada. Well, no, it's more illustrations of Canadian history. It's not text. Oh, oh it's the it's it's illustrations drawings. were took yeah, to yeah, foreground. Yeah, and they're still famous. I mean, one yeah. of the most successful uh, craft beers in Ontario has a C.W. Jeffries drawing of the Rebellion of 1837 on the label. <laughs> That's great. They sank deep into the Canadian... And they were in the readers. Some of them were, were reproduced in the textbooks as well. Just getting back to that art series, how many of those were there? Oh... Not that many, uh, again. Uh, no, probably 15 or so. You'd have to check in the biography. I can't okay. remember offhand, okay. but certainly there were there were at least a dozen. And the thing about them was many of the rising young stars of Canadian art criticism and gallery leadership, cura curatorship, were the authors. Right. So, okay. in a sense, it was also a passing on of tradition. Mm -hmm. The one on Tom Thompson? Pardon me? Is there one on Tom Thompson? I think there is, yes. So, uh, although the economy slowed down, he sure didn't. Exactly. The 40s, of course, there's uh, the, 40s there's the are, war. The 40s is the war. And he, he gets involved in publishing people like uh, Vincent Massey, a collection of speeches hmm. by Massey. He himself publishes kind of think piece books about Canadian publishing and Canadian nationhood. He publishes uh, a Canadian uh, a Canadian nation where he talks about the state of Canada. Mm. Um, and he's getting a bit disillusioned, of course, with some of the tensions in Canadian life over conscription, over a lot of things. You know, and he's getting older. And now that I'm in my 60s, I realize by the time you turn 50, you think the world is going to pot <laughs> as the younger generation. <laughs> Not <laughs> as that, good as it was before. Exactly. And that <laughs> afflicted him. And then, of course, there's wartime shortages of paper. He was mm -hmm. also involved in the Canadian war effort in stocking libraries for Canadian troops. Mm -hmm. And that was time consuming, exhausting and frustrating because, you know, the military is an immense bureaucracy of not the most yielding sort. So there's a lot going on. OK, so after the war, he, and this is, I think, something that you what you've highlighted the fact that he did play an important role in giving exposure to at least some of the modernist yes, poets in yes, Canada. Yes. Whereas but most people see him as an old fuddy-duddy. Yes, but you see, it's convenient to see him that way if you're part of the Young Turks or the Adulators. And, you know, there was an element, big element of real, pol real politic mm. because uh, Pierce realized two things. He realized the world had changed and he realized that if he was going to continue to be an important influence, he had to publish the younger generation as well. So those two impulses. And, you know, he said, he said at one point the war has done terrible things to these people and we have to reflect yeah. what's actually happening. Although I don't think that what Canadians were quite as devastated as, as Europeans were. Oh, no, no. Just no. simply because of the fact that, you know, in Europe, 
civilization was destroyed and cities were flattened and whereas here you didn't get that at least no but of course he was, you got a lot of people dead though he was dealing with some of the writers who'd had first end experience of war like will bird and uh, earl burney what about uh which john sutherland first statement from out of montreal didn't he work with him yes he did and he liked sutherland very much and of course don't forget just as Lauren Pierce was moving a little bit towards the modernists, mm -hmm. Sutherland was moving a little bit towards the traditionalists, converting to Catholicism, getting interested mm -hmm. in E.J. Pratt. I think that, you know, part of history is different because John Sutherland died young, and E.K. Brown, who was kind of a middle stander, whom uh, Pierce grew increasingly close to as a critic, he, he was, died he young brilliant. of cancer. Yeah, yes, he, he was. I was really interested in him as a, well, as a character. Well, he's a fascinating. He's a fascinating figure, really, and somebody who brought together. He was a prof at U of T, sorry, right? Well, a, U of T only and, briefly. He then went to Cornell. Yeah. And he died uh, when he died. He was a professor at the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. Canadian. Yes, a Canadian. Yeah. Yeah. Grew up in Toronto. And then Pierce cut a deal with Hugh Ayres at... Uh, yes, uh, that deal started uh, around 1930, that they would publish the... It, rather than competing with each other in a textbook series, they would have a joint series called the Macmillan Ryerson Readers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what's amusing to look at in the correspondence is as the series became successful, uh, Macmillan kept trying to buy out Ryerson. Mm -hmm. And they finally succeeded. After he died, right? Yeah. And there was always this sort of push and pull. They were each side suggesting that they were the ones that were doing the most work on oh, it. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. And, and, of course... Hugh Ayres and Lauren Pierce were both Canadian nationalists, mm. but they were temperamentally and lifestyle-wise totally different people. Yeah, Hugh was a bit of a party animal, eh? Yes, he was a party animal. Yeah. And, of course, Lauren uh, couldn't go to parties, he couldn't hear a thing, and he didn't drink. Now, this is one of the most interesting parts of the book, I thought, and this is, this is Pierce's plagiarism. Yes. You remember I said... I, I was saying earlier that behind every great fortune lies a crime. Well, certainly behind a great career lies a misdemeanor. How big is that misdemeanor? Well, it's hard to tell because, of course, we don't have absolute proof that it was plagiarism. What we have is a strong case that it was plagiarism. And, and this was the textbooks? This was the textbooks incorporating previously published material. Because he went down to the New York and... The well, yes, theory. and then assembled a whole bunch of material together. And we know that it came at a time when success, both personally and professionally, was crucial. And it certainly is an episode that he never wanted to talk about and never really wanted to face in his diary or elsewhere. Yeah, it's funny, you know, as I say, I was reading it and I was filled with admiration for him. But when I came across that, ooh, it, it's a bit well, it tainted. Do you, do you it tainted. think it was not a crisis for the biographer? who often identifies with her subject. Oh, yes. And it was so you, Yeah, you must have multiple, multiplied. I was depressed. I, so was I. I, was, uh, I, was yeah. wor I wasn't quite worshipping. Maybe you were. But I thought, this is a wonderful, wonderful the Canadian. The play. Well, you see, it's the, it's the eternal Adam in all of us, right? And this is the moment where we see it in Pierce's career. But he kind of sloughed it off and everything was okay. Yes, but you see, everything needed to be okay. It was in the interest of everyone to mm. solve that and move on. What, he had to pay 300 bucks or something like well, that? Well, they had to come to an agreement with the other uh, competing companies and pay compensation and move on. That, but it was in everybody's interest to move on, wasn't mm -hmm. it? No, when did that take place? In the early 1930s, yeah. Oh, that's, okay, that early. Okay. Yeah, that early. We go then to the 50s now. What's happening? In, this is his last decade because he goes from, uh, at yes. Ryerson, from 1920 to 1960. Well, by the 1950s, his health is very poor. Um, he's an established publisher. He's still trying to promote the modernists, trying to be a middle stander. But his wife dies also in 1954, and that's extremely difficult for him. His deafness is getting worse. 
So this is kind of the twilight decade of his career in some ways. Although, you know, he certainly publishes some very successful things. But also he's starting to be seen as somebody of the outgoing generation. And you can see that there's a, there's a gap between what his values are and the up and coming styles and tastes. You can see it in some of the things that are written of him. And there's a picture of him standing beside a writer he really admired who'd written a book called We Kept, we Kept the Light, but she's sort of dressed in the style of the late 1950s and he's in a very beautiful but old fashioned suit and you can see the kind of disjuncture that inevitably happens. You know, the changing of the guard. What's that line that Steve Jobs says? There has to be death because that's the only way a new generation can come to the fore. And he had wanted to retire increasingly after Edith died in 1954, but they really, they really stalled at the press at choosing anyone else to succeed him because of course he's a hard man to replace. And Northrop Frye was actually one of the people <laughs> uh, approached. And Northrop Frye said the very, th to his diary, the very thought makes my toes curl up. <laughs> Because, of course, Fry was many things, but he was not a people person. Or a businessman. No. Okay, so he retires in 1960, dies in 61. That's right, yes. And then nine years later, they sell the company to McGraw-Hill. Yes, yes, they do. And that was something that, you know, would have been a bitter pill for him had he been alive. And certainly his children were very upset by it. And, in fact, his children went to the media and and complain they were part of that whole lobbying effort yeah apparently the and uh, margaret atwood told me that the, the writers union was uh, created because of that yes uh it was uh, it was one of those watershed cataclysmic moments yeah but look what happened publishing. nothing yeah well how canadian is that completely <laughs> completely yes. in fact i want to i don't well okay i, I wouldn't mind, i want to touch on that a bit and then I want to get to his collecting, and then we'll... Uh... Yes, and somebody, someplace, somebody else who's interested in, uh, you might be interested to talk to, is there's a woman now who's working on that whole period, on the bankruptcy of Ryerson Press, and on the setting up of the Ontario Commission on Book Publishing, mm -hmm. and the like. I'll just uh, go back to that quote of his. Canadians must preserve a national literature as the first step toward national self-preservation. How do you do that when one of the most important, one of the two most important literary assets that Canada has is foreign owned? Well, it gets difficult. <laughs> I think is the answer to that. I think that now, I think speaking from the vantage point of 2019, we see that Canada has in many ways done it. We have writers who do encompass a uniquely nuanced vision of Canadian life and who represent Canada to the world. You just mentioned Margaret Atwood, I think all of, also of Alice Munro and a number of other writers. But, uh, you know, publishing is in parlous shape. So it's always a struggle and it continues to be a struggle. Mm. And I think that's one thing that unifies the history of Canadian publishing. You know, that is a theme. Struggling to survive. Struggling to survive. Mm -hmm. To use the Margaret Atwood term. Yeah. I think the thing that's a bit galling, though, is that, for example, Bombardier, they, the government started bailing out Bombardier in the 60s. And apparently they've been, they've received over a billion dollars. I wouldn't be surprised, yes. So just think if perhaps they might have tried to keep something that's much more important than just jobs. Yes, Canadian. but I think but I think we also have to think about the realities of Canadian politics politics and Canadian uh, society that it's much easier to make a case for Bombardier or SNC Lavalin than it is for the publishing industry because we're talking about a tangible whether it's a snowmobile an airplane. Yeah, but it's uh, no, no, there's something stuff. very tangible about a backlist. To the man in the street? To the woman in the street? I'm not talking about... All the most important books that have been written by you Canadians? Don't, I don't have to be convinced, but <laughs> I think the average Canadian does. 
Yeah, no, no. I uh, that's the. I think that's one of the problems. Uh, the is that the Canadian? average Canadian doesn't care. Look, the term you just used, backlist, would be incomprehensible to mm. many Canadians. Mm. Haven't heard that term. Of course, the sad thing is that the other most important backlist, our national literary asset, is also foreign. It's owned by Germany. Yeah. Now, anyway, I, I guess the, the point is profits from that backlist yeah. don't, don't get reinvested back into our country. Exactly, yeah. Uh, into a new gen a generation of writers or uh, however, with libraries or whatever, wherever it might go. Yes, and then the Lauren Pierces are still needed. And it would... Pierce would feel, I think, a lot of uh, a lot of worry and a lot of distress uh, at the present moment in Canadian publishing. But he would also not be daunted. Right. It seems to me that it takes that kind of individual. It's an individual who we need to sort of rise up. Rise up. Oh yes, I think there's definitely something to be said for a great man and great woman theory of Canadian publishing, mm -hmm. both in terms in terms of the dramatis personae of the game. But who's the Lauren Pierce today? Well, that's the thing. We've got some. We've got a bunch of fairly small yeah. but dynamic and impressive companies doing doing good work. But well, nothing, of course, nothing dominant. No, and of course, what we haven't also spoken about is how much the scene has changed with social media, with you mm -hmm. know, publishing techniques, with the competition, all kinds of competition. You know, Lauren Pierce barely came to terms with the paperback, and look, look at the situation we have now. Mm. What situation? Well, e-books. Uh, mm -hmm. All sorts of things. For instance, I we just went on holiday with a friend. Uh, she's been a friend for four decades. We were graduate students together in English. And she made the comment that she doesn't really buy books anymore. She reads voraciously, but she basically borrows e-books from the library. Mm -hmm. And I was horrified. It had never occurred to me. Now, I, I do read the occasional e-book, but it never occurred to me. Here's a woman... She was a senior civil servant, so she's enjoying a prosperous retirement. She's not spending it on books. That's pretty scary. Those are the kind of challenges uh, a latter-day Lauren Pierce would, would face that our real-life Lauren Pierce never dreamed of. Well, Lauren was into the material book. Yes. And um, that's how I'd like to sort of wind this down, by talking about his collecting habit. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, uh, I think he got into the collecting habit really basically to learn something about Canadian literature. Because don't forget, when he was hired in 1920, he did not have an extensive literary knowledge of the native product. And he admitted himself that his English professor at Queen's, James Capon, mm -hmm. despised Canadian That's literature. Right. So basically it became a self-education process. And from his mother, he'd imbibed the love of the book, beautiful, the book as artifacts. So he kind of combined the two. And it was also a bona fides for him in the Canadian literary world, because of course there were all these other major collectors as well. Like who? Um, Rufus Hathaway and his brother, for instance. And uh, William Kirby's son was a big collector. Archibald McMechan at Dalhousie University, who also wrote criticism for the Montreal papers. So that it was a way also to legitimize himself as a serious literateur because he had not, you know, he had not done graduate degrees in English. He had not been an English professor at a university. So... Mm -hmm. It kind of coalesced from that. And he loved collecting. You know, he collected Canadian antiques as well. He and his wife collected Canadian glass. Mm -hmm. So it was a way to become familiar, to legitimize, and it increasingly became a way to leave an, yet another legacy behind him. 
and indeed the Edith and Lauren Pierce collection of Canadiana at Queen's University is a real jewel for anybody who's interested in researching Canadian literature, Canadian literary history. So what did he do? Did he go out and visit a whole bunch of bookstores? He did. That's exactly what he did. Yes. The and neat he, thing is, he got to travel all the way across the country and back. Yes, and so yes. whenever he was in any of these cities, yes, he, he checked tried, out all the bookstores. Well, he tried to make time for that. It was, it was difficult. But basically, it was being in Toronto, the literary center, that enabled him to collect. Because he didn't have a lot of time when he was traveling. He didn't have a lot of time. No, no, I mean, he had a no. Pretty big, you, busy schedule. If you read his diary, his <laughs> yeah. diaries are at Queens. I mean, it was a real scrum. I mean, okay. they'd get off the train, say in in Saskatoon or in Regina or in Edmonton. They'd meet with board, uh, you know, committees, textbook committees. They'd lobby government officials. He'd see there'd be a lineup of authors that he'd already have to meet. There was nothing, you know, leisurely or or easy about those trips. No. And, of course, also with his lupus, you know, their respiratory symptoms. Yeah. You can yeah. imagine what it was like to be cooped up on an overheated train for the days of travel required. No, no. Well, I'm also thinking pretty dusty book, bookstores, yes, too. Yes, exactly. So what did he go after? I mean, Canadiana, but, like, did he... Oh, he wanted early imprint. He wanted everything. He was like all collectors. He wanted the early imprints. He wanted the 19th century authors. He wanted it all, and he got it all. We only have to visit the Queen's collection to see that he did do that. And, of course, once he became a publisher, mm. as you know, people presented him with books as well, his mm -hmm. authors, their earlier books. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Because he, a... that's right, he, he connected with all sorts of authors, yes. older authors. Yes. And so I imagine yes. he sort of put it the word out. It was mania. It, that's you know, so collecting's good. always a mania. It, yeah, it yeah. sure is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he his parameters were basically anything about like was it literature, was it fiction? Oh, was yeah, it, it was literature, criticism? But it was also what was it? travel writing, poetry, speeches, um it was quite wide ranging. Because, of course, he was interested in Canadian history as well as Canadian literature. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was involved with Harold Innes in, you know, pioneering volumes of Canadian history in the 20th century. So he was interested in that as well. And, of course, remember, he was in the Royal Society, which is made up not only of literary people, but of scientists, mathematicians, political scientists. So he wanted it all. He wanted to have it all, collect it all. Well, the thing is, too, that's, you know, you think about that now, it's pretty difficult. But back then, it's, a, it's an achievable goal, I think. Well, it was achievable, but it was expensive and time-consuming. And, and, but uh, time, time that he, the best kind of time, I'm sure. If you're a collector, you know. Yeah, but he didn't have a lot of time. No, I know that, but the time that he was in the bookstores browsing for stuff ah, yes. is the best time. Yes, oh yes, I agree. I, I think that was certainly true, yeah. And he does a lot of it by mail. Again, if you go and look at the Queen's... Oh, because he, he gets all sorts of catalogs from well, all Well, and he gets recognized as a serious collector. So when the Pat McGarren of his day in Ottawa yeah. finds a juicy title, he's going to write and, and see if Lauren's interested. Because yeah. they know he's a sucker for it. Yeah. <laughs> he would have loved eBay, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are some benefits to living yes, in today. Yes, there are some things he would have liked about today. Right. Anything else about the collecting? Like, no, did he... I don't think so. Uh, just that it was it was certainly one of the great underpinning loves of his life. Mm. And uh, well, sometimes it got him in practical difficulties. For instance, um, Emily Carr submitted her first manuscript to him, and he lost it. And it, it was lost for quite some time, and she became angrier and angrier. And it turned out it had been accidentally sent to Queens with a batch of books and manuscripts. Uh, that he had collected and by the time he found it Emily Carr was so alienated that she took the manuscript to another publisher and thankfully she had another copy of it uh, no they recovered the manuscript oh, they it recovered eventually it. Okay. found at Queens okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that was in the 40s or late 30s I'm not sure which 
Did you get an idea of all the different bookstores, the names of the bookstores, that kind no, of thing? No, no, no. You'd have to f- ferret that out in the... Uh, in, in the archive. The, yeah, in the archives, yeah. Okay. Just uh, finally, why should we remember Lauren Pierce? Because he was a person dedicated to Canadian culture who left an enduring mark. And I think if you're interested in anything from the Group of Seven to Canadian history to Canadian poetry, you're going to have to come to terms at some point with his influence. He was a maker of Canada. In the same way as I think we should be interested in somebody like Jack McClelland or Hugh Ayres or any number of Canadian publishers. And he was a remarkable human being. He was also very witty. He's a person that you enjoy finding out about. For that reason, yeah. Well, I really enjoyed your book and talking to you. Thank you so much. Oh, I enjoyed it too. Thank you very much for coming to talk to me, Nigel. I've been speaking to Sandra Campbell, who is the author of Both Hands, A Life of Lauren Pierce of Ryerson Press. It's published by McGill Queen's University Press. Thanks again. Oh, you're very welcome, and thank you for coming.